What we do here is go back, 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 back. back. Hello and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History. This is Chapter 19, The Increasing Influence of Europe. First up, Europeans during the High Middle Ages built a vibrant and prosperous society. Rising from foundations laid during the early Middle Ages, Lord Retainer relationships, agricultural innovation, and the Roman Catholic Church, Europe emerged from its long period of relative political instability and economic and intellectual stagnation. The hallmarks of high medieval European culture included the following the consolidation and expansion of regional states. These powerful states sometimes were organized by local rulers and based on lord-retainer relationships as in France. Other times they were direct conquests as with the Norman invasion of England. At other times they were supported or encouraged by the Roman Catholic Church like the Holy Roman Empire. The economic revitalization. With renewed agricultural surplus, the population expanded and Europe began to re-urbanize. Cities grew, and with them grew business, industry, trade, and educational institutions. Long-distance trade networks reappeared, especially in the Mediterranean and Baltic and North Sea regions. Continued presence of the Roman Catholic Christianity in virtually all aspects of high medieval life. Though both traditional church institutions and the mass appeal of popular religious practices, the church prospered during this time. The Roman church's influence was felt in education, philosophy, literature, conquests, and travel. In the High Middle Ages, Europe began to interact with increasing regularity with the other regions of the Eastern Hemispheres. Its days of relative isolation were over. So first up, we have the late Byzantine Empire. It was in the 11th century, there were wealthy landowners who undermined the theme system. So if you go back to what we were talking about before in the Byzantine Empire in chapter 16, we talked about the theme system be, uh, being a system where uh, lords or basically people in charge of those areas with land hired uh, oftentimes uh, free peasants to work on their land or they allowed them to work on their land in exchange for taxes which was the main way that they got those uh, monies that they were able to use then to have armies and conquests. Free peasants became dependent agricultural laborers however during this time as uh, more land was consolidated under these wealthy landowners which led to more of those free peasants being unable to work as free peasants and instead had to become dependent agricultural laborers which we'll talk about in a little bit this led to diminished tax receipts under the old system of the theme system the peasants were able to work as free laborers or people working for themselves we would call them maybe independent contractors today and what they would do is they would collect or farm their goods and then they would pay taxes on those goods to the lords of that area or the the person in charge of that area and they would pay those taxes which would then lead to helping that lord have a standing army or more money or just more stuff this diminished tax receipts started to undermine the theme system and it'll transition into another system that we'll talk about in a minute challenges from the west Western European economic development. What ends up happening here is we're going to see in this chapter a change and a shift away from kind of the stagnation that happened right after the fall of Rome and the kind of decentralization of authority within Western Europe. As Western e European economic uh, powers developed, more and more people were able to create more systems which got them out of the, what we would call the dark ages and move them into the high middle ages where they start to transition into a more modern world that we would kind of understand today with cities and with people working as specialized labor and having the ability to uh, work for themselves the normans from scandinavia press on byzantine territory so these normans are originally from scandinavia they are occupying northwestern france as well as the scandinavian areas they press down into the byzantine territories of uh, anatolia the crusades of the 12th and 13th century rampage through byzantine territory we'll talk about that in a bit and constantinople in uh, the byzantine territory the head the capital city is sacked in 1204 during the fourth crusade under the venetians we'll get to that in a bit the challenges from the east the muslim seljuks actually invade anatolia which is uh the area that little pen that um peninsula that Byz the byzantine empire sits on and they originally threatened the grain supply. Remember that if we go back to the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire worked under a system of having kind of areas of trade or areas of control that they were able to get things that they wanted or needed, specifically food. 
And as the Muslim Seljuks invade Anatolia, they're able to threaten the grain supply that leads to the Byzantine Empire, forcing them to have um, economic distress and also uh, food shortage problems. The defeat of the Byzantine army in 1071 at Manzikert creates a civil conflict between Byzantine forces. So after uh, the Byzantine Empire army is defeated in 1071 at the city of Manzikert, or at the Battle of Manzikert, excuse me, it creates a civil conflict where these peoples within uh, the Byzantine Empire start to fight amongst each other, having a civil war. The Seljuks, uh, during that time, take over most of Anatolia, and the Crusaders from Western Europe control the rest. This period of steady decline until uh, the Ottoman Turks capture Constantinople in 1453 under Sultan Mehmed uh, II. They, when they get there in 1453, rename Constantinople Istanbul. Now, the Byzantine Empire will last in our section up until about 1453, and we see it as kind of the... Um, the carrier of the torch of the Roman Empire up to this point. They still spoke Latin, they still had uh, recognized the Western Church, as we talked about before in chapter 16, and they see the world in a lot of ways as kind of the heirs to the Roman or Latin tradition. Well, this all changes in this chapter, well, in a few chapters from now, but as we move in that direction, the Byzantine Empire slowly starts to decline. Here's a map of regional states of medieval Europe from 1000 to 1300 CE. In the bottom right, you can see the Byzantine Empire, where Constantinople is located on the uh, mouth of the Black Sea. Uh, that's going to slowly be taken over in the east by the Muslim uh, Turks, or Seljuk Turks, and then you have the western half of Constantinople, of uh, the Byzantine Empire, excuse me, being taken over by many of the Crusaders as we get farther on into this time. In the very center, we have the Holy Roman Empire. We're going to talk about that in a bit. Then we have the establishment of England and some of the other bigger uh, countries that we'll get to eventually. Next, we'll have the Holy Roman Empire. Otto I of Saxony takes advantage in the decline of Carolingian Empire to establish the kingdom in the north. We've talked about this idea before that as centralized imperial or strong centralized government falls apart, local lords establish control over small areas in absence of those strong leaders. So Otto I sees the vacuum of um, strength in his local area, specifically northern Germany in the mid 10th century CE, and what he decides to do is to establish a larger regional kingdom for himself in that area. He makes some military forays into Eastern Europe. He twice enters Italy to aid the Roman Catholic Church. Um, under Pope John the 12th, he names Otto the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in 962 CE. Now, this establishes the idea of the Holy Rem Roman Empire, an attempt to reintroduce imperial authority into Europe. During this time, in the uh, chapter 16 we talked about before, uh, after the fall of Rome, there isn't really any central emperor, there isn't really any leader that many people in the former Roman Empire could look to. Byzantium was very far away in Anatolia, most of Western Europe was left to fend for itself under these local regionalized rulers, and under Otto I of Saxony, after his defense of uh, the Roman Catholic Church, he is named the emperor of a holy Roman Empire, which took up a, a large section of Central Europe. There were tensions, however, between the emperors and the church. For example, there was the investiture contest, the late 11th to early 12th century. Pope Gregory the Seventh attempts to end the practice of lay investiture. Now, the problem with the evolution of priests from the Christian religion in Western Europe during this time had some issues. In the old system, under the Roman Empire, the titles of, for example, bishops and uh, priests were oftentimes seen as civilly placed, uh, which meant that the government placed those people into their positions. However, with the introduction of Christianity and the adoption of the systems of the Western Roman Empire into Christian life, the problem becomes who's really in charge of those priests. As Pope Gregory VII attempts to get rid of the lay investiture or the ability of emperors or local regional peoples to place priests and bishops into their positions, he effectively is trying to wrestle back uh, power from those local leaders and place it back in himself as the pope or the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. Through the practice of fighting with these um, emperors, he eventually excommunicates Emperor Henry the fourth, uh, who lived from 1056 to 1106, which excommunication again means kicking out of the church, meaning that there were a number of things that 
kind of associated with that. He was no longer allowed in church, Roman Catholic churches. He, uh, in many ways, would have seen himself as being unable to enter heaven because he would have been kicked out of the only uh, religion that said that if you want to be a part of the afterlife with uh, Jesus and all he's done for you, you have to be a part of the church. But since the Pope has kicked you out of the church, you now are in serious danger of no longer being able to live a life in heaven. The German peoples then take an opportunity to rebel. German princes enhance their independence during this time. Because of the inability by both groups to really come to an agreement on this, these German princes decide that they're going to do their own thing. This eventually will come back when we talk about Martin Luther and why he's able to be successful in his uh, Reformation efforts with the Catholic Church eventually leading to Protestantism. But these German princes really are able to do their own thing largely because no one's really telling who anybody who's in charge. It was quashed with some difficulty, this investiture contest, but uh, really it keeps coming back to who is really in charge of the church, who is in charge of the civil authorities, such as the leaders of, of areas, and who's really in charge in general, and who places who in the power positions. Next, we have Frederick Barbarossa. He ruled from 1152 to 1190 CE. Frederick I, also known as Barbarossa or Red Beard, attempted to absorb Lombardy, which was northern Italy, into his sphere of influence. Popes did not want him to gain that much power and actually uh, create a coalition of aid from other states to force him to back down from that time. But through this process, there is a, a tension that is created, a push-pull factor, or a push-pull uh, between the powers of who is really in charge. Again, we're going back to kind of the the Pope versus the emperors or Pope versus the kings. Who is the person that's supposed to be making the decisions and who places uh, those priests who in a lot of ways acted like local uh, authorities in charge? Now at this point, you might be asking yourself, what was the Holy Roman Empire and why was it so effective? The issue really becomes uh, kind of trying to establish a centralized or imperial system that was to kind of replace what had been absent in Western Europe since the fall of the Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire, as quoted by or as mentioned by a uh, famous philosopher later named Voltaire, said that it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. So when you think about where the Holy Roman Empire was located, it was located in central Germany, not Roman. It wasn't really holy because it seemed like the emperors were really not ha getting along very well with the pope, who was supposed to be the so seat of all holiness, and it wasn't really an empire because nobody seemed to listen to those people who were placed in charge. The reason it became so ineffective was because these local regional rulers saw these conflicts and these push for more uh, land and more power as really just constant conflict that led uh, to many different groups asserting their own uh, way of life. If you look at this little picture here, there are shields on there of different um, groups of princes who really saw themselves as being their own group, who saw oversaw their own land. And they oftentimes would come into conflict with one another. And through this conflict, there wasn't really a sense of who's in charge or, or how, who are we supposed to listen to? If we're a peasant, we're really looking around going, well, that guy's really mad at that other guy, but we pay taxes to this guy and he helps us, but sometimes he's off fighting another guy and, well, we're just going to keep our heads down and keep, you know, farming. So it really didn't trickle down as much as you would think with the chaos of this conflicts, these conflicts, but at the same time, uh, people really were constantly at war during this time trying to establish more authority over their lands and gain more influence through conquering and fighting. There were regional monarchies in France and England. In Capitan France, Hugh Capet secedes uh, the last Carolingian emperor. We talked about the Carolingians before, and in 987 he was chosen by other regional rulers to be the next Carolingian emperor. Uh, it slowly he expands his authority out from Paris. He was really a regional ruler over Paris, and through that expansion, he's able to kind of establish not modern France in the way we'd understand it, but l a larger portion of what we'd kind of look at as France. The Normans uh, invade England in 1066 under William the Conqueror, uh, pictured here. They dominate the Anglo Saxons and other Germanic groups who had moved there during the uh, Roman Empire period, and as a result, they come into conflict with one another. To this day, many uh, 
a joke is passed between French and English under the sense of, well, they're just English and we really don't get along, and it goes all the way back to things like this, where uh, there is a contest between who should be in charge, who are we fighting, why do they say that we need to pay taxes to them, uh, who owns this land, and whoever has the bigger army and is willing to fight, they then are able to say, oh, that must be the person in charge. In Italy, there was a series of ecclesiastical states, city-states, and principalities. The papal state was directly controlled by the Pope. It was a good-sized good territory in central Italy. Uh, by the 12th century, these city-states increasingly displaced church control in northern Italy. The, the whole of Italy during this time is not one unified country. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Rome was seen as being the center of an imperial system, but since Rome is no longer held as an imperial power or kept as an imperial seat, uh, really there's just the church in Rome and Vatican City, there is all these groups that see themselves as being independent from them, and by the 12th century there are city-states or small cities that rule over their region, which pretty much doesn't extend outside their city that far, and they push control out of northern Italy, specifically cities like Florence, Bologna, Genoa, Milan, Venice. The Normans, in absence of this strength, invade southern Italy and displace Byzantine and Muslim authorities with the approval of the Catholic Church. Again, if you're the Catholic Church, we go back to chapter 16, not very big on uh, the Byzantine Church and their Eastern Orthodoxy. And if you're the Roman Catholic Church, you really don't like the Muslims as well. And so there is this sense that as the Normans come into southern Italy, they're pushing out those two groups. Uh, the Catholics see, really, we'd rather have someone we can agree with who are Catholics, who really are on our side and will defend us, uh, and we can get along with them way better than those other two groups. On the Iberian Peninsula, specifically the areas of Spain and Portugal over there, Muslims control the Iberian Peninsula from the 8th to 12th century. From the 11th century on, Christian conquests of Spanish Muslim territories happens. Uh, Christians see the domination of Spain as an incursion into Christian territories, especially uh, for many of those people living in Western Europe. They saw that as a land of Christianity and the Christians uh, try to conquest out uh, Spanish Muslim territories, specifically in Spain. By the late 13th century, Muslims remain only in Granada, in Spain. Next section we're going to talk about, pretty much, focuses on some changes in Europe that led it to being a more uh, powerful entity on the world stage. The four major changes in Europe really focus on kind of a structure that looks like a chain. They start with agricultural production, which meant more food, and we'll talk about how they got there through technology and some other ideas, which led to urbanization, which because of a surplus of food, people were able to move back into cities and have special, more complex and specialized work. This complex and specialized work led to manufacturing, and that manufacturing led to a surplus of goods, which led to trade, and new trade network, networks and techniques are set up in, as a result. The first major change is the growth of agricultural economy increasing development of arable lands. Now, arable lands are lands that are good for farming. Number one, it uh, minimizes the threat of invading nomads. As you're able to have land that needs to be defended and land that's able to be used for farming, peasants and uh, other people that are living on the land are able to see that there are people coming. They're able to defend the land if necessary until the nobles can show up with their knights. These um, created the ability for nomads not to just come in and, um, for example, those Vikings that we talked about before, being able to just travel up rivers, being able to flow on up and get really close to castles. Instead, they were able to kind of have different towns they would have to be stopped and slowed down by for people defending their land. They cleared swamps and forests. Uh, originally, nobles opposed this because these swamps, these forests were seen as game preserves where these nobles could hunt. However, upon reflection, many of these nobles saw them as positive because tax revenue could go up. If you're a farmer and you aerate the land and you start making a farm on there, well, now you have to pay taxes for me to be able to protect you from those crazy nomads showing up and raiding. So even though the nobles were not really happy at the beginning, they changed their minds. This leads to improved agricultural techniques. As people are able to understand more and more about agriculture and much of the information is disseminated throughout Europe, 
they start to learn a couple things. Number one, they uh, rediscover some ideas about crop rotation. There's less depletion of nutrients. When you plant crops, if you plant the same crop in the same area of land over and over year after year, what will eventually happen is the soil will lose out on some of the nutrients that make that crop or assemble under the soil, you know how science works, and that depletion will result in less agricultural yield, meaning they won't have as much food or the food won't be as nutritious or it wouldn't, might not even grow at all. In crop rotation, what you're doing is you're rotating what specific crops you're placing in specific tracts of land so that as the plants grow, they are able to uh, take different nutrients that were from the uh, soil and put back into the soil other nutrients that naturally occur during the growing process of food. At the same time, uh, many of these peoples are creating fisheries or lakes where they populate with fish and they're able to ha- increase their protein in their diet. They domesticate animals which lead for fertilizer and food as they're able to understand that fertilizer through their droppings are able to add more nutrients to the soil. Then they get new tools, specifically horseshoes. As the horses walk on the soil, they can get cracks in their hooves causing the horses not to be able to pull as hard, not being able to... Um, work as well or even injure the animal to the point of making the animal useless. Horse collars. Originally you placed a basically a rope around a horse and you you kind of hit it while it pulled a plow until it basically went forward and dragged the plow behind it helping you to uh, aerate the land. But with horse collars it moves the uh, point of contact away from the horse's neck and places it more on its shoulders and upon its chest and so the horse is wearing more of a backpack and what it does is it helps it to pull stronger and it wouldn't allow the horse to be choked. Horses being choked while they pull plows is not a good plan. This leads especially to people experimenting with new crops, especially beans. This is a protein that uh, many peasants could readily get, readily afford, helping their nutritious uh, calorie counts go up, and it's also a nitrogen fix for the soil, as talked about with the um, crop rotation techniques. Here is an example of a horse collar. You can see it's it's sort of around the horse's neck, but really it's more placed upon like the chest of the horse, and you can see the additional parts where it actually wraps around the, se- the center of the horse. And since it's wrapped around the center of the horse, it places the weight less on the horse's throat and more upon its like stern, like right in the middle. Here's a picture of a horse, by the way, and how like big and powerful these horses that were pulling these plows. Originally, these farmers were using oxen, and as they transition to the horse collar, they're able to use horses, not hurting the horse as much, but being able to give the horse the ability to pull a lot um, more weight. And because horses are faster than oxen, they are able to aerate land quickly and efficiently. Here's a chart we look at all the time, which is population growth between 800 and 1300 CE in Europe. There's our arrow going up. And we talked about this before about the um, as calorie counts increase, population increases. But I do want to make a mention that there's a kind of an addendum to it or a supplement to it that as efficiency of production increases, population increases. What we are seeing here is not necessarily the the establishment of more food. What we're seeing is the efficiency of being able to create more food through different techniques like crop rotation and uh, the use of technologies. Through this uh, production increase, this efficiency of production increase, population goes up as a result. It's less about like having food or not having food, but actually having the ability to create more food with less land or create better food with less land. Second major change is the revival of towns and trade. It's again a three-part chain. As the food supply increases, many people are not necessarily needed to work on individual farms. So urbanization follows the increase in food supplies. This urbanization is the reintegration of the peasants or the farmers into the cities and this leads to specialization of labor. Since Roman times, the cities were, this is the first time this happened since uh, Roman times, the cities become the centers of economic and social development. It's similar to the agricultural revolution if you look back to what we talked about in the, all the way in the first chapter. As people are able to not have to work all the time to find food, they're able to create for themselves jobs that create uh, money or trade that they can then use to give themselves food. So that we don't need a whole bunch of farmers, we need a, a bunch of efficient farmers who then are able to free up time for others so that we can have economic and social development through specialization of labor. The third major change leads from manufacturing. As specialization of labor happens, 
Many cities start to move into manufacturing of goods with a surplus. Textile production becomes huge, uh, clothing, dra tapestries, drapes, things, things that are made out of cotton or wool. And through this manufacturing and this surplus, we lead to the fourth major change, which is Mediterranean trade. As Western Europe moves itself back into the world stage as being a place of having enough food to take care of themselves and also a surplus of food, which leads to more goods that they can produce, they're able to take that and trade it to the Mediterranean. If you think about where Western Europe is, it is not really centrally located compared to, say, India or China or West or Eastern Asia. So as a result, many of the traders were able to take their goods from Western Europe, get them to basically the Mediterranean. From there, they would be placed on boats and many traders would be able to travel around the world taking their goods far and bringing back some of those more uh, exotic delicacies that people liked. Italy is well positioned for sea trade. To the west, it has Western Europe and it has Byzantine and Muslim trade to the east. And eventually they will lead all the way to, um, their goods will be able to get to India where we'll talk about Emporia later and then eventually to China. Italian colonies are established in major ports of the Mediterranean and the Black Seas, and this is kind of the start of Western Europe getting back into the groove of international trade. A uh, fourth major change continued, the Hansetic League. Hansa, as it was known, is an association of trading cities. This was kind of response to what was happening in the Mediterranean. Many of the groups that were still doing the urbanization, still doing the culture, the um, agricultural change, still doing a lot of the shifting that we just talked about, are kind of far away from Italy, or it's too expensive and costly through taxes and tariffs to get those goods from the northwestern uh, Europe to Italy to be traded out. So there's trade in the Baltic and the North Seeds. Poland, Northern Germany, Scandinavia. Now here is a network of roads in the ancient Roman world. This is Roman cities, these are Roman roads, and I wanted to show you this because I wanted to make mention of the, the kind of lasting impact that the Roman world had on Western Europe. To this day, many people can still see the traces of the Roman roads, and in many places in Western Europe, those roads are thousands of years old, originally kind of carved out in the directions that they were as a result of the Roman Empire. And then from here, we're going to overlay the map of the Hansetic League. You can see it up in the top, as the green little box shows. Those red cities are pretty much the Hansetic League, an agreement of trade networks between those peoples that really had uh, good trading ties, was able to uh, make money between one another, and trade goods uh, farther and more efficiently than before. There's social change. So back in the chapter 16, we talked about a little bit of the three estates and feudalism. Now feudalism, I want to clarify, was more about the ad hoc relationship or impromptu or non-formal relationship between lords and people who fought for them. During that time, uh, there was really this kind of extension of like latifundia as older, uh, well-established army people got to be older and they lived through the campaigns and the wars, they were given land. Through that, they were able to oversee populations, make money through taxes by allowing peasants to work on their land. When we get to Byzantium, we talked about the free peasantry system through the theme system and how it was similar in that there were lords who probably got their land more than likely from fighting or being in armies and using that ability to, again, collect taxes and uh, protect their peasantry through the use of uh, loyalty through nobles and having private armies to protect their land. As we get into this chapter, the three estate system really applies back to uh, an evolution of what we were talking about before. It really becomes three parts, those who work, those who fight, and those who pray. Those who pray, the clergy. The clergy's job is to pray, again, for the souls of everybody. They are the most devout and they're the smartest, so the peasants and the knights and the lords all trust them to tell them, well, what does God want? What, do, what are we supposed to do as good Christians? And they pray on our behalf that God looks down favorably upon us. Those who fight. The knight's job was to protect the peasants and the clergy from bad dudes who showed up with swords. 
as the knights went out, they protected the land. The reason they were protecting the land was to be able to protect the peasants who would pay taxes to the lord. So uh, if the peasants are all dead, you don't have the ability to collect taxes, meaning your army is going to get mad because they're not getting paid. Those who work, the peasants. The peasants have a very important job because their job is to make food and pay taxes. If they don't make food, nobody eats. They don't pay taxes, the lord doesn't have any money to pay his knights. As this intertwined system worked out, it becomes uh, really complex. And it's not as simple as there's three jobs and those are the only three jobs that everybody had. What it really becomes is oversimplification of a complex social reality. Uh, through the change in urbanization, there isn't really a place for like blacksmiths. There isn't really a place for lawyers. There isn't a place for artisans. At the same time, there were also mercenaries that were developing, uh, people who were being paid to uh, fight on behalf of whoever paid the most. And it didn't really necessarily mean that you had loyalty or fealty to an individual lord. Also, these monks aren't necessarily loyal to the lord of that area. The monks were really an international brotherhood that all pledged allegiance to God and to the Catholic Church. So maybe they didn't see the power that was given to the lord of that area as being legitimate necessarily all the time, and so this system doesn't always work out simply, and that's why feudalism, the theme system, the three estates system all kind of intertwine depending on what region we're looking at and what specifically we're talking about. Chivalry. Now with the knights came this new code of conduct for nobles. Uh, it was sponsored by the church to minimize fighting amongst Christians. Uh, one of the things that's kind of weird about Christianity sometimes is when you look at Jesus, you see a person who talks about uh, peace and talks about like loving your brother and gives uh, kind of a positive outlook on the world. He also has verses where he talks about not coming to bring peace, but to bring the sword and turn brother against uh, brother and father against son and son against father. And there's a lot of violence wrapped up in Christianity, especially for fighting against bad people. If God has deemed them bad, especially in the Old Testament, the job of the Israelites back in that section of the book is to go out and get, kill them. God has ordered them to kill them. So chivalry is developed to really kind of be supported because there was a lot of infighting between Christians. Remember, all these groups that are fighting for power, like the Capitans and the uh, William the Conqueror's Normans, they're all Christians. They're all the same church. They're all agreeing that Jesus died for their sins, yet they're fighting and killing one another. So the church sees this as a way to kind of turn down the violence because chivalry, you were supposed to be devoted to God and to a noble life of purity. Technically, a knight was dedicated his efforts to the promotion of Christianity. That was the idea in chivalry. You weren't supposed to really go around and just kill people for money. That materialism and that uh, effort that's spent on really hurting other people so that you can get more stuff doesn't really always gel really well with Christianity and the teachings of Jesus and eventually Paul in the New Testament. Uh, chivalry is developed as a way of encouraging knights to be good moral people, but also as a protection of women. Uh, if you compare raiding parties throughout time, violent men do violent things to men and women. And knights' jobs were to actually protect women, and this is the start of the development of passionate love between men and women. If you remember back, many times uh, a lot of marriage wasn't always centered around uh, love. It was centered around land arrangements. It was centered around uh, ending wars. So young, many times daughters were married off in an effort to kind of s combine families so that they can't really fight each other because it would get kind of awkward. Through chivalry, it's designed as a protection of women that good knights are supposed to protect women from bad guys. They're supposed to not hurt them, not violate them, not do bad things to them, but instead are supposed to care for them and treat them with respect and honor. At the same time, there was a group called troubadours, a class of traveling poets, minstrels, and entertainers. It's borrowed from the Islamic traditions of love poetry coming out of Spain. Uh, it's spread of cultural ideas to Europe. Talking about chivalry, uh, these troubadours would make a, a song or a poem and they'd sing in the courts of the noble people to those knights and talk about how a man is supposed to treat a woman. Or they would sing about how a knight valiantly defended a woman from being attacked by barbarians. And as uh, they went around, they would collect money for their efforts. They were the first uh, what we would call like professional musicians. 
it was popular among aristocratic women because if you think about it, they're, they have money, they're around nobles, and they're around knights all the time, and they really like the idea that if they're going to have to marry these guys that are around anyways, they might as well kind of teach them to have a certain way of looking at the world. And the way they want them to look at the world is to respect them, is to take care of them, to love them passionately. And so, for example, Eleanor of Aquitaine, one of the most famous women of her time, was a major supporter of troubadours, made sure that they were always writing songs, always kind of promoting this chivalrous ideal and Christian values. It was the popularization of ideas of romantic love and refinement of European knights into being less brutal, uh, violent dudes who stab everybody, but instead more into uh, going and defending the honor of a town or going and, and, and sacrificing for his love the ability to go and save her from bad guys. And so these troubadours became very popular amongst uh, the elite. Independent cities. Addition to the class of those who work were merchants, artisans, physicians, lawyers, lots of jobs that we can understand today. It was awkward to fit in the framework of medieval political order because they don't really have a job in that triangle that I talked about before, but at the same time, they're really important to this new urbanization movement and they're really important to kind of the running of trade or everyday life. By the late 11th century, towns demand charters of integration of greater self-government. Because towns are able to pretty much create a lot of these jobs, and because they're able to trade, there isn't really a lot of those towns seeing the need for lords anymore, or uh, regional rulers. So what they say is we really want the ability to rule ourselves. Uh, different cities see the the need for a big army to not be necessary because they have food themselves and the city can pay for that army. Or uh, when it comes to food, if they actually need food, they could trade goods that are made in the city for food to farmers or food to other traders who are looking to make more money. So by the late 11th century, these towns don't see the need for this old um, feudalistic or estate system. Guilds start to form. They're organizations of merchants, workers, artisans. We can compare them to unions today. By the 13th century, guilds control a good portion of urban economy. The way a guild worked is like this. Pretend you're a blacksmith and you make swords. As a guild worker who is a blacksmith and makes swords, you would probably spend a lot of your time working on swords, making swords in your, fact, in your warehouse or, excuse me, your workshop. Uh, many of these guilds did things by restricting membership to the class or group who could do that work. So the way they did this is they had people who were apprentices or people who would learn the trade. As they would learn the trade, they would uh, be taught a very specific way to make that good, specifically like in my example, swords. If you were one of my apprentices, I would teach you exactly how you're supposed to make this type of sword, and I would teach you the steps and the process, and I would teach you until I felt you were confident enough to do it yourself, and then I would let you kind of do it on your own. They would uh, maintain quite price and quality control. Price because let's say there are multiple blacksmiths in a town. If you're a part of a guild, you pretty much are all guaranteeing that your swords are good and the work is probably plentiful enough. What you want to do is try and create a price that's fixed that everyone can kind of agree on and make it make a nice living and then the people will come to you and say how much for the sword and you might say 20 gold pieces or whatever. And if they went down to the shop down the road that was another blacksmith shop part of my guild, the same sword would be the same price. We wouldn't be competing with each other, and that would allow us to kind of have an understanding that we're kind of in this together, we can support one another, we can work together, we can make enough on our um, product that we're able to have a comfortable life rather than kind of undercutting one another through this process, and quality control. If you've ever bought anything that's cheaply, like a cheaply made thing or a knockoff of something, they're not really the best quality. They might work for a while, but they're nothing compared to probably the real thing. And that quality control was something that these guilds prided themselves on. The ability of guilds to say that if you buy a sword from one of our guilds, it's going to work great. It's going to cut people in little pieces or whatever. It also created a social support network. Guilds built guild houses, and in there they would have um, the families of the guilds, or just maybe the men of the guilds. Uh, there were women who were allowed into guilds. Uh, they could support one another on festival days. They would come together and they would hang out. Or if you just needed a place to relax, you went to the guild house. And many times it became the places of um, just bar for that group. 
Uh, we see that today with like lodges, or you can. There are union houses. There's one down the street from my house that um, is like a local welders union, and there they do the paperwork for the people, help them out, maybe train people, uh, make sure membership is being taken care of. They deal with problems. Say somebody's not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they make sure to go and talk to that person, help them, support them in any way they can. Uh, they also provide kind of a, a respite for those people who are part of the guild. Urban women. New economic opportunities for women. Women in most of history have not been doing great. They don't really have a lot of opportunities. They're pretty much owned by whoever male is like oldest and closest related to them, whether it's their father or their husbands or even their sons if both are dead uh, or their brothers. Uh, so women, as a result of this new urbanization, are able to have new ways of making money. Before, they were just farmers working in a field next to other farmers trying to eke out a living. Uh, through urbanization, women dominate the needle trade, uh, being able to create textiles. Uh, it's something that is kind of suited to at least the, the mindset of women, of, of how they saw women during that time. Women could sit at home or in a workshop. They could work without laboring in the hot sun or laboring in um, the fields. They could use a small needle and make something very pretty and sell it for a lot of money. Uh, many women were admitted to most guilds, meaning they had that uh, apprenticeship system, they had the protection of uh, the guild when people were trying to undercut them or uh, abuse them in any way. And there were some guilds for women only in uh, Paris, for example. The book talks about how there was a few guilds that were just women only, and they were probably needle trade uh, guilds. But guilds were great for uh, the men as well as the women, is what is this slide's talking about. Cathedral schools. During the early Middle Ages, European society was too unstable to provide institutions of advanced learning. You didn't really have time after the fall of the Roman Empire. There were too many people running around stabbing people. There wasn't really a centralized government. Nobody really had any free time because you're really just supposed to get up, take care of the farm, make sure that everybody's not dead, and then grow some wheat and then pay your taxes. But now, as urbanization happens, people have more leisure time and people want to get educated. Some rudimentary education at monasteries, and occasionally there were scholars at courts, at courts, but then we move into the high Middle Ages now when we're talking, and increasing wealth makes education possible. If you were an educated person, or if you were a wealthy person, you had the ability and the luxury of being able to pay others to educate your children, not necessarily in what you did, but in things like Latin, literature, philosophy, some law, some medicine, some theology, and as a result, cathedral schools were created. Schools were called cathedral schools because they were based in cathedrals. They were large buildings. They're not really occupied during the weekdays. So children would go there, learn from educated teachers, and then they would go back home. And when they grew up old enough, they were able to have more knowledge and probably help out in different ways. I mean, you guys get why education is important, I hope. Universities then spring up. Academic guilds then formed in the 12th century, both student and faculty organization. The student guilds were formed as a way to protect students from the burdensome taxes and kind of abuse that towns put on them. Many towns saw students as being vulnerable. Because they don't really have anything that they can offer to the town yet, many places charge students a lot of money for staying. They charge them overpriced uh, monies for goods. Uh, and the students were there to able to force the cities to actually provide them with housing or food or shelter, whatever it may be, and they were able to have strength in numbers. At the same time, faculty organizations were uh, formed to protect their independence of teaching from local rulers or from the church, and students also, during this guild and faculty time, uh, argued that they should be taught by good teachers and that those teachers should make an effort to try and teach them the best they could rather than if you, I mean, you could imagine if you were supposed to go and find a teacher and there was no schools and there was no system of schools, you might just pick a bad guy who doesn't really know much and makes it all up and doesn't teach you anything. Through this process, students were able to push back against faculties in the towns. The faculty was able to argue that students need to have a certain amount of, um, expectations and through this process they were able to uh, have higher standards of education which were promoted and um, the faculty was able to also give out uh, degrees what we call degrees today which allowed them to uh, tell students that yes they learned from the teachers or the faculty in 
Paris. So now if they wanted to go somewhere else, they had the ability or the right through these degrees that they are qualified to teach in other areas. <clears throat> During this time, there was an influence of Aristotle. Uh, what happened was, after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Romans were really good at keeping the libraries, but in Western Europe, because of the Dark Ages, they lost a lot of translations of different works of Aristotle. Latin translations of the Byzantine Greek texts circulate in Europe. Jewish and Muslim scholars, on the other hand, provide other translations from Arabic translations. And through this process, Western Europe starts to discover more of <clears throat> the writings of Aristotle. St. Thomas Aquinas is a uh, theologian teacher in Paris, and he's a major proponent of scholasticism. Now, scholasticism is the combination of Western Gre Greco-Roman uh, philosophy, uh, what we would call like Aristotle's teachings, and Christianity. St. Thomas Aquinas believed that scholasticism was the way the world worked. It was a synthesis of Christianity and Aristotle. Uh, Aquinas believed that Aristotle was talking about the way the world worked, he just didn't know about Jesus and God yet, so obviously he just couldn't like finish his argument. It's like listening to somebody who's making a lot of good points, but they don't really have the end in mind. And St. Thomas Aquinas would say that, of course, uh, Aristotle was telling the truth, and it's great, everything he said was awesome, but you need to now add the Christianity part, and that makes it a complete uh, picture. And through this process, Aquinas is seen as a major uh, like founder of the way uh, Western, the Western world looks at uh, theology, they look at like logic and reason, and uh, through this process, this Western Europe kind of goes on a wholly different track than say Eastern Europe or even Eastern Asia. At the same time, uh, many of the lay people, the people who weren't priests or weren't really well educated, didn't really care that much about scholasticism. They really didn't understand Aristotle because they probably couldn't read because they were too busy farming. So the things that really got to them was more uh, the sacraments, the things that they did on a daily or that they interacted with on the daily life that affected them. So scholasticism <clears throat> might have been awesome for all those guys living up in the university, but really the guys, the most important thing for the guys working in the fields was the seven sacraments, gain ritual popularity. Big uh, seven for Catholics, even to this day, are baptism, confirmation, matrimony, penance, Eucharist, or communion, taking care of the sick, and holy orders. Baptism. When you're born, uh, in the Catholic Church, they're supposed to take holy water, rub it on your head in the sign of a cross, say some words, and then the, you are sealed, or uh, there's like a symbol of uh, God's placing of his hand upon you or seeing you, just like Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Bible. This is kind of a hearkening back to that. Next comes confirmation. You're presented to the church. Uh, you're shown as being like a person, and they kind of do some more ritualistic stuff, and everybody's happy. That's your next one. Two down. Matrimony. You're supposed to get married in a Catholic church to a Catholic, and you're supposed to be a Catholic as well. That means that you're going to have a good, blessed marriage and a good, blessed life because marriage is supposed to make you holy. Uh, penance. When you do bad stuff, you're supposed to go to confession and say you're sorry and then do things to correct those things. So let's say I stole something from somebody. And what I need to do is go to the church. I need to confess to the priest, and I need to have the priest tell me what to do to make amends for that. Maybe it's saying Hail Marys or saying a certain type of prayers or going on a pilgrimage or venerating some kind of relics, or it might be just going and paying for what I did and apologizing. Uh, Eucharist or communion becomes super important. It's a ritualistic uh, retelling through uh, the motions of the final uh supper or dinner of Jesus. So what happens is the priest would take the bread that was placed on the altar and he would break it and he would talk about how this was Jesus' body broken for um, the sins and then he would talk about uh, the blood of Jesus which was represented by the wine and how it would be the washing away of the sins or excuse me the body is the body the bread is the body of Christ broken and the wine is the blood wa for the washing away. And this becomes really important because that's kind of the main thing you do at every Catholic uh, Mass, as you watch the priest do this. Now, um, many churches in the Catholic Church, you actually partake of it. And this during this time, it pretty much was just like done as kind of like a, a play, and nobody really ate it. Uh, taking care of the sick, uh, that's a big thing. You got to go around. Jesus like healed the sick, so your job is to like make sure that they don't, you got to try and make sure they don't die. And holy orders, if you're kind of like wanting to or doing pretty awesome. You uh, want to be a priest. 
or you might eventually rise up to a bishop or a deacon or something and you want to be a part of the church and help organize and support it in any way you can now all seven sacraments are not necessary like for every person but uh for sure the eucharist became very important during this time devotion to saints are another big thing you might think like well okay yeah i i'm a catholic but one of the hard things is like jesus is up in heaven and he's like die for the sins awesome thanks jesus uh god he's running the world so we can't bug him that holy spirit thing they might not really completely understand but uh what they do say is like okay those saints those people that like we hear stories about and we tell each other about those guys were awesome and they were just like us so i can try and be like them or even if i can't try and be like them they might like care a lot about like what we're doing down here and so i can pray to them and then they will intercede or talk on my behalf to god or to jesus because they're awesome and like i'm just a bad sinner down here on earth but if i tell like for someone like example the virgin mary or jesus's mom that uh i need some help maybe she'll tell jesus uh to help me out and then that'll work out really great there's a story in our book that talks about how one man apparently prayed to the virgin mary to save him from a hanging and she like saved him don't know how but that's like a story that was told and so people started to venerate or um praise and pray to those saints as a way of kind of uh connecting to heaven in a way that made a lot of sense to them because they're like people because jesus was like god right and god is god and the holy spirit is part of god so we don't really get how that's going to work but i can get my mind around some like dude who like was really holy and like i can be like him and we can work together well he can work on my behalf uh, they make pilgrimages as well. That's a kind of really simple thing where just like with the Muslims that go to Mecca, you have a pilgrimage to maybe go to Jerusalem or probably more than likely you just went to a uh, church that was maybe a cathedral nearby or a big church for your region and inside of there they might have relics uh, such as the bones of some dead martyr who was killed way before and he was awesome because he was willing to die for his faith and we kind of go thank you for all you did for us and and i'm gonna you know leave a, a coin here and that'll help the church and and it, it's kind of awesome right uh during this time the biggest saint was the virgin mary jesus's mother pictured here i just like this picture i don't think it's a very traditional um picturing of her but it's kind of cool like lots of interesting things going on in there Religious movements spring up. There's a rebellion against perceived materialism of the Roman Catholic Church. During this time, no one really wants to leave the Catholic Church, even if they see it as kind of being problematic. So St. Dominic and St. Francis create new orders of mendicants or beggars in the Catholic Church. These men see themselves as trying to uh, help correct some problems in the Catholic Church without leaving the Catholic Church. St. Dominic and St. Francis believe that the Catholic Church became so, like, materialistic and really focused on, like, this world. They were always involving themselves in politics and war, and it seems like Jesus wasn't really big into politics. It seems like he was really into, like, helping the sick and wandering around talking about the gospel, and so they see their job as really going around as preachers, and wherever they would go, they would preach for a while, and then they would ask for uh donations or for food or for stuff to just be given to them as a like payment for their bringing of the the story of the gospel that's found in the bible they took on vows of poverty they didn't really own anything except for maybe a robe maybe a bible maybe some thing to eat food out of but really they had very few possessions they became popular preachers because in many areas those uh populations those newly urbanized centers had lots of people in them and not everybody could go to church at exactly the same time or maybe uh people just live far away so these preachers were able to bring the sermons and the gospel to those people that weren't able to make it to church all the time but they could congregate in their local uh area and those people could preach uh, they were religious zealots and very opposed to heretical movements. They were very anti people kind of doing their own thing. They still saw the ch Catholic Church as being important. They just thought that it was kind of losing its way and they were trying to help uh, correct it. Popular heresy springs up during this time. Specifically, the Waldensians, they are in southern France, northern Italy. They urged more lay control or common people control of preaching and sacraments. They thought that uh, the Bible doesn't really say anything about like priests doing everything, so we don't understand why like we can't have just like normal people preach if they wanted to, or why can't um, like normal people just give the sacraments, especially the Eucharist? Why can't why do we have to have a priest do it? Why can't we just like do it in our homes? And the borgo mills and the cathars or 
Albigenians flourished in both Byzantium and Western Europe. They were ascetic regimes. Remember back to the ascetics that we talked about before, rejecting all worldly like happiness, basically, and rejection of the official church. They went even more extreme, believing that the Catholic Church was corrupt and that it was not even worth being a part of. The government and the church do mount a campaign to destroy both. A couple reasons. You're the government. You don't really like people challenging authority, period. And if people start to listen to them and they start to turn on not just the church but on the local authority, and you are placed in that authority by either the Catholic priest or you have a good relationship as a Catholic with the church, they might turn on you. And if you're the church, you just don't want people messing with your vibe and making sure that uh, your message is still getting out to the people in the way you want it to get out, and by telling people not to listen to you, it's causing lots of problems. By the 14th century, only around a few in a remote locations, the Catholic Church does a really good job of stamping them out as uh, heretics. Medieval expansion of Europe, Atlantic and Baltic colonization. The Scandinavians explore the North Atlantic Ocean. They make it all the way to Iceland, Greenland, and eventually to Vinland, which we know as Canada today. So, those Scandinavians kind of decided to get on boats and just keep going until they hit something. So Canadian settlements do not succeed, but when the original um, uh, reports come back, they see it as being a land of plenty. It's called Vinland because they find vines of grapes there originally. And uh, they we're not 100% sure if they left or if they all died there, but we do know they abandoned the settlement and they don't succeed as a result. Uh, this is the first incursion into North America that we can really record. Kings of Den Denmark are nominally converted to Christianity, uh, which means they, they saw Christianity as beneficial. They kind of liked it, but they still held on to their older traditions and religions. Sweden and Finland follow shortly after. Then we get to crusading orders. Religious Christians form military religious orders, specifically the Templars, the Hospitallers, and the Teutonic Knights. These guys' jobs basically were to do a couple things. Number one, they were completely loyal and obedient to the Catholic Church. They saw themselves as being warriors, not just monks, not just priests, but warriors, guys with actual swords. They also saw themselves as having one major job, stamping out uh, Islam and paganism. They saw both Islam and paganism as an affront to Christianity, as something that was taking the good people of the world away from the truth of Jesus, and so their job was to fight the people with swords who were trying to bring uh, a different message from a god they didn't recognize, whether it's Allah or some random god from paganism. So they made religious vows of physical opposition, both through prayer and through fighting. They founded churches and monasteries mostly uh, on the way from Western Europe to Palestine and Jerusalem. Uh, many of them saw themselves as protecting pilgrims on the way to Jerusalem, those who were making pilgrimages to Jerusalem, or as fighting in the area of Palestine to try and push out the Muslims and the pagans that were living there. The reconquest of Sicily and Spain. Sicily is taken by Muslims in the 9th century, and it's reconquered by the Normans in the 11th century, as mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a slow displacement of Islam, and at the same time, there's an opportunity for cross-cultural fertilization. As these groups are really uh, pushing one another out, they're still trading, they're still making money off of each other, they're still talking about philosophy and theology and science and art and architecture, and through this process, a lot of Islamic uh, science gets passed on to Western Europe, a lot of uh, the ideas of just the past that the Muslims were able to kind of collect and preserve as Western Europe kind of fell apart during the Dark Ages is able to be retransmitted. A lot of new discoveries, specifically Arabic numerals like that came from that the Muslims got from India are transmitted over into uh, Western Europe. And two small Christian states survive Muslim conquests. And these become the nucleus or the center of reconquest or the reconquista specifically in Spain between 1060s and 1492. These are rapid forceful assertions of Christian authority. Basically the Christians show up with large armies, loud priests, and say we're here, we're taking back the land for God, the, they say the right God, and we are going to make sure that there are no more Muslims and this whole land is going to become Christian once again. The beginning of the Crusades. Pope Urban II calls for the liberation of Jerusalem from Muslim control in the year 1095. There's a picture of him right there on the right. He has the Council of Claremont, and the famous line from it is Deus Volt, God wills it. And so uh, here's a little picture of kind of an artistic rendering of what happened there. And let me read you a little section from the, uh, 
source book of medieval history, kind of a, a storybook of people who are uh, recording some of the things that were said during this time. So this is Pope Urban II on the uh, eve of the First Crusade. All who die by the way, whether by land or by sea, or in battle against the pagans, shall have immediate remission of sins. This I grant through the power of God with which I am invested. Oh, what a disgrace if such a despised and base race which worships demons should conquer people which has the faith of the omnipotent God and is made glorious with the name of Christ. With what reproaches will the Lord overwhelm us if you do not aid those who with us profess the Christian religion? Let those who have been accustomed to unjustly wage private warfare against the faithful now go against the infidels and end with victory this war which should have been begun a long ago. Let those who for a long time have been robbers now become knights. Let those who have been fighting against their brothers and relatives now fight in a proper way against the barbarians. Let those who have been serving as mercenaries for small pay now obtain the eternal reward. Let those who have been wearing themselves out in both body and soul now work for a double honor. Behold, on this side will be the sorrowful and the poor, and on that the rich, on this side the enemies of the Lord, on that his friends. Let those who go not put off the journey, but rent their lands and collect money for their expenses, and as soon as winter is over and spring comes, let them eagerly sent out on the way with God as their guide. Well, that's kind of a powerful little thing, but let me kind of talk a little bit about it. Number one, kind of talks about some of the things that we need to kind of uh, practice. This new AP test that we've been uh, looking at uh, has a lot more common uh, text in it, and it has a lot more primary sources that you just need to look at, kind of decode a little bit, so I kind of want to spend some time and look at it. First up, all who die by the way, whether by land or sea, or battle against the pagans, shall have immediate remissions of sins. The main thing that uh, Pope Urban II is talking about is that all who go on this crusade will immediately have all their sins forgiven. That was not a guarantee during this time, especially before Martin Luther and his whole argument about uh, faith and uh, being able to have forgiveness of sins without the need of a priest. So this was an attractive offer. If you're a knight and you kind of feel bad that you've been killing a bunch of other Christians or you've been fighting a lot of people and maybe you're just kind of a drunken douche, you now are having the ability to make it to heaven even with all the bad stuff you've done. This I grant them through the power of God which I am invested. The Pope was, uh, during this time, believed to have the power of giving complete remission of sin. Oh, what a disgrace if a despised base race which worships demons or conquer people who has faith on upon God and glorious with the name of Christ. Uh, go fight the Muslims. With what reproaches will the Lord overwhelm us if you do not aid those who with us profess the Christian religion? God will be mad at us if we don't help those Christians living in Jerusalem. Let those who have been accustomed to unjustly wage private warfare against the faithful now go against the infidels and end with war victory this war which should have been and begun long ago. Those who are used to fighting their Christian brothers should now go fight the Muslims because we should have started this war long ago and we're totally going to win. Let those who for a long time have been robbers now become knights. Anybody who's bad, now become a knight. Pick up a sword, let's go. Let those who've been fighting against their brothers and relatives in a proper way against the barbarians. You've been, be, you've been bad fighting against your brothers, go fight the Muslims. Let those who've been serving as mercenaries for a small pay now obtain the eternal reward. It, as before, if you were a mercenary, you were getting small pay, fighting bad dudes, probably even people you knew, but now you can earn the eternal reward or heaven. Let those who've been wearing themselves out in body and soul now work for a double honor. Let those who have been doing lots of labor, now why don't you, like, instead of getting money, you're going to get, like, heaven. Behold, on this side will be the sorrowful and the poor, and that the rich, this side the enemies, the Lord, and his friends. Let us go, not put off the journey. Um, it's going to be awesome. We're going to win. Let those who go out put off the journey, but land your land, expenses, go on winners over. Let them eagerly come the way it goes. Okay. Uh, go out right now. Rent your land out. Go get some stuff, like armor and swords and stuff, and then start once winter's over, and God will guide us. Make sense? Pretty easy once you take it all apart. First Crusade is what we just talked about from 1096 to 1099, the more organized expedition. They eventually captured Jerusalem in uh, those three years, largely due to poor Muslim organization. At first, they were a little confused. Many Muslims didn't understand why they were under siege. They understood that these people were here to kill them, but they didn't really understand what the deal was. Christians weren't really mistreated, neither were Jews in Jerusalem. Many of them just had to play the jizya, which was the tax for the unbeliever. Jerusalem was well maintained. Mosques were not uh, were erected, but so were church. Kept, churches were kept up. Um, temples of Jews were there. Everybody kind of not really got along, but for sure it wasn't 
complete violence and chaos the whole time. So as a result, Muslims are unable to rally around uh, Jerusalem and defend it. However, Saladin, or Salah al-Din, recaptures Jerusalem in 1187, and there's a picture of him on the left right there. Medieval expansion of Europe from 1000 to 1250 CE. If you zoom in on the little parts of uh, what we would call like Palestine or the Middle East today, we have the Kingdom of Armenia, County of Edessa, uh, Principality of Antioch, the County of Tripoli, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, if you look at our map, we have these arrows that show kind of the route of the First Crusade. They went from Paris, and then they went through the Holy Roman Empire, and it took a long time. There are many, many, many sad stories about uh, these Crusaders running into people who were actually Christians but didn't look like Christians they knew and were practicing Christianity differently than them, and they still slaughtered them thinking they were Muslims. There are many stories of tons of people starving on the way there because they didn't have enough money and food as the crusaders went from town to town they would see like price inflation so for example if you lived in a small town of like 100 people and then you see an army of like a thousand show up and you have the last chicken i think you can get a lot of things if you wanted to trade a bunch of hungry soldiers for one chicken so there's a lot to the crusades we don't really launch into it beyond this because it's a really complex and controversial issue but as you can see there were about four to five crusades fourth one was a complete disaster that basically had nothing to do with um getting to jerusalem it was really the venetians trying to uh make money and raid constantinople Later Crusades and their consequences. Five Crusades by the mid-13th century, none were successful. None of these ended up in having a long-term successful effect on conquering or capturing Jerusalem. The Fourth Crusade destroys Constantinople. Venetian traders saw the ability to harness the power of fervent Christians and the Catholic Church in a way that they could make a bunch of money. They rented out the boats to the church from Venice, and they were able to get a bunch of soldiers on these boats charge them lots of money, charge the church lots of money, and they dropped them off in Constantinople, and they had the people raid uh, Constantinople and bring back many goods. To this day, there are still these like four uh, like bronze horses that are in uh, a famous cathedral in Venice that were taken from uh, outside of Hagia Sophia in um, Constantinople. Yet crusades provide direct contact with Muslim ideologies and trade. Just like when there was the Reconquista, these crusades allow Muslim ideologies and trade to kind of cross-pollinate. People are able to save the science, technology. They're not always fighting while they're there. And Aristotle uh, is traded, Arabic numerals, paper production is all traded during this time, and it ends up being kind of a benefit, even though uh, it was many, many, many negatives as a result of many dead people. We made it. When you finish studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. Compare and contrast the rise of Byzantine and Holy Roman Empires. What's the difference between the one and the other? Uh, how did the one rise? And what happened to it? And how did the other one rise? And what's kind of the differences between them? Compare and contrast the development of regional monarchies and states in France, England, Italy, and Iberia. I draw a little square chart and try and figure that one out. It's kind of important to kind of know how these regional monarchies kind of developed independently and kind of realizing their patterns. Explain the growth of the post-classical European agricultural economy. What was that change I talked about a little bit before? The four major kind of shifts and some of the like major improvements specifically to agriculture that happened. Next, discuss the revival of towns and trade across Europe and the Mediterranean. How did the agricultural economy lead to the revival of towns and as urbanization happened? That's a key word there. Uh, how did that lead to more trade through Europe and the Mediterranean? Next. Explain the important features of post-classical European social change. What changed from what I would call the Dark Ages, or many people call the Dark Ages, to the High Middle Ages? What was the big like things that changed during that time, socially specifically? Next, outline the development of schools, universities, and scholastic theology, all the way back to Thomas Aquinas. Next, explain key features of popular religion. What, what were people doing, not the St. Thomas scholastics? Uh, reform movements, people who believe that the Catholic Church was okay, but we need to fix it, and popular heresies, the things that the Catholic Church was really mad at and many of the leaders were mad at too. Finally, compare and contrast European expansions during the Middle Ages. What was changing? Where were people going? What was all those other people doing that weren't uh, the Crusaders? Writing assignment. Write a short response, five days sentence, and the following questions. Use specific examples of text. Be prepared to discuss in class. Number one, consider the northern Italian city-states that emerged during this period. How did they become so successful and prosperous? What roles did they play in the economy, politics, and religion of Europe? Number two, 
The Roman Catholic Church encountered many challenges during this period. What were they? How did the church manage to meet and challenge each challenge and still thrive? What do you predict will happen to the church after this period? It's a good thing to think through. Number three, some historians believe the institutional foundations of modern Europe, and by extension, us over here in North America, where I live, first appeared during this period. What political, economic, and social institutions can you see emerging of during this period? Explain their beginnings. As always, it's been great talking to you. Uh, now it's time to reread that chapter. I hope you've been uh, following along. We've made it all the way pretty deep uh, here into our book. We're nearing the end. You should be kind of uh, taking some time to really review your chapters, really getting prepared for that AP test. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to comment on the YouTube channel. As always, thanks for stopping by. Thanks. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.